Dr. Sharfstein, we're beginning to see politicians act. John Farrell brought up on Friday or Thursday the positivity rate. Can we have a rule-based or single rule system to unwind our policies on the pandemic wrapped around a ratio like a positivity rate? Well, I think positivity rate is important, but it's probably not enough because it depends a lot on the number of tests and who's getting tested, and a lot of tests aren't getting reported. But the concept that you're bringing up, having an approach to, to unwind, I think we're seeing that happen in different places organically, but the key metrics for me would be around the number of COVID-related hospitalizations. That'd probably be number one, right. um, and um, potentially cases number two. Um, but uh, I do think that there's you know room to to move, and I think we are going to see over the next couple months that um, it's going to be okay to slowly um, back down on certain uh, measures that we've been living with. 2022 is different than 2021, but it doesn't mean we're in 2019. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm going to ask the question I believe I've asked every single day for the last week. Cases roll over. You mentioned the good news, hospitalizations roll over. Do you just presume deaths will roll over? Yep, uh, I do think that's going to happen. It's just a terribly tragic moment still because so many people are losing their lives. And it's a reminder of how much is at stake and how we can't just, you know, forget about the pandemic. But yes, uh, that is what's going to happen. I, I don't know if you remember at the beginning or in, in December when we were talking about this, we saw the curves in South Africa and we said, you know, we're going to get a similarly shaped curve in the United States. And, that, and that's what we've been getting. It's just now we're on to that second phase. Um, and on the other side of the Omicron curve, we've got, you know, important work to do. Dr. Sharfstein, how difficult is it uh, for you as a public health official to keep talking about uh, remaining vigilant, having caution, staying away from people, not necessarily going to the same sorts of pre-pandemic activities at a time when there is a primal cry going up in the likes of Ottawa, where there are protests about additional lockdowns, where you have children that are dealing with the scars of what happened when people are saying we can't keep going with this and you're seeing uh, sort of other health issues spring up up that are consequences of the social distancing era. Well, I think part of the message isn't just, you know, stay away, stay away, stay away. Part of the message is do more, you know, um, find your your place of, of risk tolerance and, you know, um, do uh, do more. And depending on the person I'm talking to, generally, they're, they're pretty happy that I'm saying it's OK to do things. So I don't really feel like I'm coming in with a doom and gloom message. I do think that the vast majority of people want to be cautious and do not want to go racing into, you know, a huge cloud of COVID. Um, and so while there are some people who are, you know, quite upset and, and obviously um, they should be listened to, but, you know, certain point, you know, the society gets to decide how to protect itself. Um, uh, I do think that uh, overall it's not that hard. Okay, so going forward, you do think that it's uh, important for people to loosen up. Do you think that this world has gotten so polarized with respect to those who are cautious and those who think that it's all bo uh, bupkis, basically coming out and saying, you know, look, you got to take a middle ground, you have to move on, that it's incredibly difficult to do that? It is very difficult because I'm worried, and I've um, done some podcast interviews with people, and we've talked about this, that you find a, a good middle ground, you find those thresholds, you take a step as a society and policy, and nobody is happy with it because half the people think it's too far and half the people think it's not far enough. And so it really emphasizes how important it is for public officials, for public health officials to be explaining, explaining, explaining relentlessly, trying to get as much uh, social understanding of the, the, the policies that are getting put into place. It's been really hard. People are dug in, but there's just no alternative. And the more people who understand the basis for a decision, the better off you are. But I do agree that there's a big risk. You'll have people on both sides who feel betrayed, frankly. Doctor, just quickly, I just want you to speak to something a little bit more clearly. So many people have been talking about this report, this work that came out of Johns Hopkins that lockdowns did not work. That wasn't affiliated with, with your school, the School of Public Health. Can you walk me through the conclusions of that, the questions you have about it? 
Sure. Well, that was a, a working paper um, that one of the authors was affiliated with Johns Hopkins, not the School of Public Health. It's it's not peer reviewed. Its conclusion purported to be that lockdowns don't really affect mortality much. But to reach that conclusion, they created their own definition of lockdown, um, and they picked and choose which studies that they were going to include. And it's a reason why studies like that really do need to be peer reviewed. It doesn't present new data, and it doesn't change any of the basics that we know, which is that the coronavirus is a respiratory virus. It transmits between people. Um, the more contact between people, the more transmission, the more hospitalizations, and the more deaths. And early on in the pandemic, um, stay-at-home policies were necessary to prevent, you know, a the transmission of a serious virus that we didn't know a lot about. But fortunately, we have other tools now, and those include, you know, vaccines, tests, masks, and because of that, we don't have to resort to stay-at-home policies.